behind me is the Three Horseshoes Pub in Hempnall, and it was here that a mysterious German spy, a man named Captain Baker, was active during the war years. So you, you live in the village of Tasbara and you yeah, seem to... Yeah, I have done for 43 years, so... And you're 84, you said 84? Yeah, yeah. And you said you do remember that there was a, a spy in the village. I remember, yes, that uh, there was something about a pub, I know, uh, came into this somehow. Captain Baker was a member of the British Union of Fascists, which was, it had some underground support in East Anglia. And he was giving some speeches in the Church of Tasburg, very pro-Hitler, very anti-Jewish. And so immediately he attracted the attention of the British Army, who had pegged him as a spy. So they let him continue, and they didn't intern him when they interned the rest of the fascists uh, around 1939. And he was on the run. He shaved his uh, trademark handlebar mustache, and it was just active in the local area. And he was going into the Horseshoes pub, getting, you know, to be a fly on the wall. And they would get drunk and he would hear them talking. And they caught him finally in 1941 with a flashlight pointing up at the sky, signaling German planes flying overhead. They put him in jail in the Isle of Man. When he got out of jail, it was very clear that he'd gone insane. And he started founding these, they called them esoteric Hitlerist groups. They worshipped Hitler as a god. And he was interned in the Isle of Man for the entirety of the war, whereas most... British fascists were only interned for a short period of time. He was 1941 all the way to 1945. And even Oswald Mosley was let out of after only a couple of years. And what I think made him go insane was because, one, he had a very terrible record with PTSD. Twice he was buried alive in the trenches of World War I. And he probably came to view democracy as the cause of World War I, like a lot of British fascists like Mosley and a lot of people whose fathers died in World War I. And two, he had connections with the aristocracy, with the nobility or the, the noble families and, and the rich, wealthy people that lived in their country houses out here in East Anglia. And when the war ended, all of that came crashing down. But still, he had a church where they worshipped Hitler in a country house. So he still had some very weird connections to the, the upper class out here. And he died in 1966 because all of this came crashing down. The original house was built on this land and... He was said to be flashing his torch to let the Luftwaffe know who was here, uh, sending messages to them. Uh, he was caught, and we were told that he was actually executed here on this pathway, but that's an urban myth. He was actually arrested and interned in the Isle of Man. And uh, this house has been rebuilt, but the houses back there are still... Yeah, that's the original. Is he a commonly known figure in the village? We only found out about when we were renovating the house and somebody came up and said a bit of the history and said, you know, a German spy used to live here. And this was a bunker? Yeah, we like a small bunker here. Do you think it was made with his idea in mind? Of... I'm not too sure because I think that in the end they just were using it for storing coal and stuff like that. Mm. And this house back here also is original, right? Yeah, that's the house. Oh, in the so photo of Cat's Corner? Yeah. So the photo that, uh, the 1902 or 1907 photo, that wasn't uh, the home that he had lived in. That was the right across the way. Yeah, he was in this uh, little tiled bit of it. Then it was, I take it that was knocked down because of what he was doing. Mm, yeah, I wouldn't want that associated too hard with my village either. I've seen they then built the bungalow in the 50s. So I think that was knocked down. So about a year and a half ago, I visited the village of Tasboro on the coast of East Anglia. And I wanted to tell a little bit about the history of a German spy in the village. And I found that a lot of the people in the village actually remember the German spy, but they know nothing about him. But I'm going to go back in. I've already deleted some of the audio in the earlier part of the video, but I want to clarify so that the people in the village know. I have a couple of them on social media, and I'll show this to them. But St. Barb Baker was active in World War I. And he was a very, very much a badass in World War I. Got a medal for gallantry, and when a shell struck a trench... St. Barb Baker ran down into the trench with poison gas and brought all the men up out to safety, even though he passed out twice from poison gas. And it was also said that he was literally buried alive on more than one occasion by shells. And when he was being interviewed at this prison camp because he was a fascist in World War II, he said, I didn't like the Great War, sir, not one bit. He was racked with PTSD. But essentially, he was also very right-wing. Being in East Anglia, a lot of people in those counties are aristocratic families, and they saw their rights being stripped away in a Europe that looked more democratic. 
So he joined this group. I'm, I'm reading some of the names off now. He was a member of something called the Right Club. And the Right Club was sort of this recent incarnation of something even earlier called English Mystery. And English Mystery was a secret society of fascists that had their headquarters in London. And this is a very well-known thing. It actually existed. They had members of parliament, they had aristocratic families, and they believed that Britain had a duty to reestablish serfdom, colonize the world, and kill the darker races because they believed that would bring them power. And the Right Club, basically, it included Guillaume St. Barb Baker, who was the uh, member of a aristocratic family in East Anglia that was slowly losing their power. It included a man named Captain Peter Eulen Wright, that's E-L-W-Y-N, haven't found any information on him online other than his portrait hung in the main Nazi party headquarters in Munich. And he was British army. So he clearly had some foundational aspect of Nazism because it hung up in the offices that Hitler seized in the beer hall push. He knew Commandant Charles Cole, who was a member of the group, Arnold Lees, another British officer who helped SS officers escape after World War II. He knew a uh, member of parliament, John Beckett, uh, Lord Redsdale, Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, who was an aristocrat. Uh, he knew Commandant Mary Allen, Faye Taylor, who was a uh, female English arist uh, like sort of socialite. He knew Admiral Barry Domaville. He knew a lot of others who formed this core of British National Socialists. But during the war, most of them switched from supporting fascism to supporting Britain because they viewed king and country above fascism. But St. Barb Baker went a little bit off the deep end because he didn't believe in World War I. He was buried alive and poisoned by gas and had PTSD. You can kind of see where he's coming from. So he continued these fascist activities and speeches, but he's underground in East Anglia. Both spies were sent to East Anglia where they gathered some information and mainly stayed underground for a planned German invasion that never came. And when they finally captured this guy, Thomas Guillaume, they sent him off to a prison camp in the Isle of Wight. And he actually came to know the Mad Hatter, that is Battersby. And a lot of the British officers at this camp said that Thomas Guillaume Baker made a conscious choice to act insane. Because at this point, Battersby, the Mad Hatter, he dealt with Mercury his entire life. He was insane. And he was hardcore fascist, and Battersby believed that Hitler was God. And when his wife visited Guillaume, he was best friends with Battersby. It was basically these two stuck in a crazy feedback loop. And uh, when he saw his newborn baby, Guillaume St. Barb Baker said, look at the, the birthmark on the baby's head. That's a swastika. She's the next Hitler. So his wife realized that he was either insane or pretending to be insane and left. And when the war ended, he left. But the membership of the Wright Club, there was a red ledger book of all the members, basically covered up and nobody was really allowed to write about it. So a lot of these people were active in financing World War II, and they didn't want to talk about it because they were members of parliament and members of basically every structure of British society, from priests to educators to respected news anchors and royal family. This was covered up, although it existed, and you can find it out there. But St. Barb Baker decided to keep his friendship with the Mad Hatter going because the Mad Hatter was fantastically wealthy and certifiably insane. And these two men formed something called the Legion of Christian Reformers. On the surface, it was Christian, but everything else about it was Nazi. They bought a bust of Adolf Hitler and they worked it inside of a country estate in East Anglia. And some police raided it in the middle of the night and said, we don't know what happened. And they eventually just kind of went into hiding. And in 1955, they went to the Cenotaph Parade in London and shouted, Heil Hitler. And the police had to pull them from the crowd that was about to murder them. And it's said that St. Barb Baker at the time was probably trying to win the favor of the increasingly insane Mad Hatter Battersby so that he could get some of his money and fortune. And that's probably exactly what happened because later, a couple years later, Battersby tucked a note in his pocket that said, uh, my work here is done. The victory of the Aryan people is, sure, is assured Heil Hitler. And he jumped off the ferry, which popped its head right off. St. Barb Baker probably inherited a good deal of money from this because he went down to the island of Jersey and never really made any public appearances again, although I believe he spoke to some neo-Nazis, but he mainly fell off the radar. So it seems like he developed PTSD during World War I. He was always a member of these right-wing clubs. When he was in prison for it, he started leaning into it so that he could win favor from this crazy guy that had a huge fortune to his name. 
And in the process of this, he met a bunch of members of British Parliament and a bunch of representatives and a bunch of aristocratic families. And after World War II, he continued this cult-like relationship so that he could bleed the Mad Hatter dry of his money and fortune. And once he'd gotten it after the Mad Hatter killed himself, he just hightailed it off to the island of Jersey and never really made any public appearances again. 